Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 254, recorded on August 17th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start with Android 13. Once the makings of a big news cycle, these days, Android has matured to the point that yet another release is a fairly standard affair. Combine that with the limited uptake of a new Android release, and sometimes a new version goes totally unnoticed by most. But as we record, Android 13 is rolling out to Pixel devices, and then soon to Samsung Galaxy devices, Asus, OnePlus, and others. And most importantly, at least I think, it's landing upstream in AOSP right now, so that's great to see. Actually, there's some stuff in here that is really good, including multi-language support for apps, but also one I like to see a lot landing in Android 13 is official built-in support for Bluetooth LE audio. So developers can now start using LE capabilities on compatible devices. That means battery life on some of these Bluetooth LE devices is just going to be mind-blowing. It's great to see that built in now. We're also seeing the beginning of a new feature that's coming to Android, and developers need access to it now so they can start baking support in, hopefully, to future versions of their apps. And this caught my attention. It's called Predictive Back Gesture. So in Android 13, they've introduced a new API where your app can tell the system how it's going to handle back events in advance. In practice, they call it the ahead-of-time model. They say this new approach is part of a multi-year effort to help prepare your apps to support the new predictive back gesture, which is available in testing right now if you turn on the developer options. Another headline feature this time around is tablet support. Google says 13 has been optimized for large screen layouts, though, honestly, the implication in the release announcement is a lot more work needs to be done around the tooling. Notification permissions and photo library access are now more in line with the iOS style of asking the user for permission first. Ooh, I like that. I also like that application performance has got a big boost in Android 13, thanks to some updates to the Art runtime. And the good news there is Google plans to ship those improvements to other versions of Android through Google Play updates. Well, it's great for those of you who... Uh use the Play services, <laughs> and overall, Android 13 looks like a really nice update. Perhaps what Android 12 just should have been all along. Google is asking developers to start testing now, and I think, hopefully, since this isn't really a life-changing upgrade, we'll see a significant uptake from the hardware vendors out there. Just when we thought Linux was entering an era of gaming utopia, Rolling release Linux users discovered some bad news I'm afraid we're all going to have to deal with sometime soon. And it really touches on what should be the upstream responsibility for long-term compatibility and stable ABIs. And unfortunately for some users, they're finding themselves trapped right in the middle of that debate as their anti-cheat-enabled games began breaking after recently updating to glibc version 2.36. The breakage stems from the DT underscore hash section being dropped in the GNU C library altogether. The GNU C library, or glibc as it's often known, has traditionally supported two ways to get your hash on, DT underscore hash and the newer GNU underscore DT underscore hash. Now, these days, most consider the GNU version to be better structured, and DT GNU hash has been around for a decade and a half at this point. But, as you're probably already guessing since we're talking about this, the makers of anti-cheat software are still relying on the old, non-GNU version. Yep, and once rolling Linux users, like Arch users, began updating their system, they got that new version of glibc, the one that only has the GNU hash section. And, well, understand it's not just anti-cheat games that are getting broken, other Linux apps are as well, such as libstrangle, but Really, anything that relies on the traditional DT underscore hash section is breaking with glib 2.36 due to this change. Over the past week and a half, this issue has been discussed pretty darn thoroughly on Valve's Proton Bug Tracker. Thankfully, for those on Arch Linux where the problem was first reported, glibc 2.36-2 is currently in testing and reverts the earlier change, so both styles of hash are still included. 
And being those rolling release maniacs, Arch users have already tested that testing package and confirmed that anti-cheat enabled games are once again working correctly. As far as getting the fix upstream for this issue, or maybe just rolling the change back upstream, well, it's not really clear what's going to happen right now. A Proton developer at Valve says that the upstream glibc discussion on dt underscore hash isn't coming out in the direction of prioritizing compatibility with pre-existing applications. They added in a tweet thread, quote, every such instance contributes to damaging the idea of desktop Linux as a viable target for third-party developers. I can definitely appreciate that. I mean, I don't want my games to break. But as ever in Linux, there's multiple parties, multiple projects, and multiple developers involved. On the glibc side, there's definitely been some discussion about how best to address this issue going forward. Carlos O'Donnell, a glibc steward, said, quote, What I would like to see is more feedback from the anti-cheat teams about exactly what they need. He also pointed out that, quote, Depending on DT hash and specific loader semantics is going to break at some point. To make this issue a little more complicated, although perhaps also a potential avenue for a fix, is that the old style of hash is still marked as required in the upstream specification. So a change at that layer might at least signal to downstream consumers, like anti-cheat software, that they really shouldn't rely on just the old style of hash sticking around. And of course, because this is Linux, right now, a lot of the control rests in the hands of distributions. Carlos also emphasized that DT underscore GNU underscore hash was added way back in 2006 and has kind of been the standard on Linux for the last 16 years. Also, this most recent glibc change was made to allow distributions to choose how backwards compatible they want to be. So really, at least from some perspectives in the glibc camp, the choice to have DT hash or not is with distributions. If this breaks specific applications, then those developers need to engage with those distribution ecosystems or adapt their software. Yeah, it's stories like these, Wes, where I think the Valve developers are thinking to themselves, well, I'm glad we built SteamOS because they're clearly going to mitigate this at the distribution level and other distribution makers are going to have to make the same decision. There is some good news out there this week for Linux gamers, though. Proton 7.0.4 shipped just a couple of days ago and it brings a whole batch of new Windows games to the Linux fun. It's not just better game compatibility, though. There's an exciting lower-level improvement shipping with Proton 7.0.4. It's support for file system copy-on-write behavior, at least for supported file systems like our dear ButterFS. The goal here is to reduce space used by game prefixes, which is really nice to see for some of us on smaller NVMe drives like me. Linus Torvalds released the first release candidate of Linux 6.0 this week, officially making this current cycle the big 6.0. But uh, if you want to call this release 520 or whatever, Linus said you can, quote, go right ahead. Fun games aside, it is kind of nice to have that settled. Or, well, at least as settled as anything is in the world of Linux. But, you know, we've talked a lot about how many features are getting packed into this release, and there are a ton. But one of the things that seems to have missed the RC window is Rust. Torvalds lamented about that a bit in the release notes, writing, quote, I actually was hoping that we'd get some of the first Rust infrastructure and the multi-gen LRU VM, but neither of them happened this time around. He did emphasize, though, that, quote, there's always more releases. Indeed. I hope so, at least. I kind of find it a riot, though, to just watch the meta story develop around Linux 6.0 and also to watch Linus consistently try to tamp down expectations and just call this not a big deal constantly. But the media outlets, they're all in. They've been playing all kinds of games this week, and I think you could be forgiven for actually thinking the final version of Linux 6.0 had actually shipped. Uh, the headlines going around are just totally detached from reality now. Here's a couple of examples from just the last few days. ZDNet's headline, quote, Linux 6.0 arrives with performance improvements and more rust coming. Uh, the register also had a doozy. 
Linux 6.0 debuts missing some rusty bits, <laughs> making it sound like it's a shipped product. I assume just to get the clicks. Maybe it's been a, a slow news cycle over the summer. I don't know. But none of it really matters, I would guess, at least not to Linus. Uh, he wrote himself, quote, the kernel version numbers are really entirely made up and have no intrinsic meaning. I don't know. I mean, there is something to like the numbers sure, sure seem to matter to some people. He can keep hammering that point away, but alas, I'm not sure it's really going to change everyone's minds. This release cycle also left the kernel just 50 patches away from real-time support finally being integrated. But there appear to still be some roadblocks that kept those patches out of the tree, at least for the 6.0 RC1 release. Yeah, unfortunately, that was one of the other big headline features for this release. But I think the other way to look at that is we're just about 50 patches or so from this actually landing. So hopefully this real-time work will manage to cross the finish line later this year with Linux 6.1. August 16th was Debian's 29th anniversary. So we wanted to send them a big happy birthday from all of us here at Jupiter Broadcasting. The project is helping local Debian groups worldwide plan Debian Day celebrations. If you're interested, we'll have a link to the local Debian groups page in the notes. Linode.com slash LAN, L-A-N. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. And it's just a great way to support the show. Linode is fast, reliable cloud hosting with the best support in the business. Real humans every day of the year. Linode's how we run everything that we've built and everything we continue to build. Our new website, we're building it on Linode. And like us, Linode loves Linux. They bake it into everything they've done, everything they've built over the last 19 years. Nobody has them matched in this area. And they're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers. They want to lock into their crazy platforms and try to upsell you every single day on all their little services that they all have to have cute little esoteric names for. And by cute, I mean horrible. But on top of that, Linode has the best performance. They've got 11 data centers around the world you can choose from. And of course, their interface is simple, straightforward, and easy to understand with great documentation and an API that lets you do everything. And then they have a bunch of great features on top of that. Object storage, cloud firewall, simple, elegant backups, Kubernetes and Terraform and Ansible support, and so much more. And if you're a performance hound, your application needs a lot of throughput, go check out Linode's MVME storage and dedicated AMD Epic CPU rigs. So go build something, go learn something, try it for yourself and support the show. You just go to linode.com slash LAN. That gets you the $100 so you can really try the service. You can get a genuine idea of what it's like to use it, what the performance is, what the feature set is, and you can get that for 60 days. Go lock in and kick the tires. Go to linode.com slash LAN. One more time, support the show, linode.com slash LAN. Collide.com slash LAN. Collide is endpoint security that uses the most powerful untapped resource in your entire organization, the end users. You know, when you're trying to achieve security goals, maybe it's an internal goal. Maybe it's one for a third party auditor. I had to do that for years. Maybe it's just something the boss wants done. The traditional approach is treating every device like it's Fort Knox with old school tools like MDMs that force disruptive agents onto employees devices. Rex performance makes the machines feel like they're five years older than they really are, and it turns IT admins and users into enemies. Plus, a lot of these tools create their own security problems. Let's be real. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes on users, Collide sends them security recommendations via Slack. Collide will automatically notify your team when their device is insecure, and it'll give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve those problems. By reaching out to employees via a friendly Slack DM and educating them about company policies, Collide can help you build a culture in which everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. And for IT admins, Collide provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet. Maybe they're on a Mac, maybe they're on Windows, or maybe they're on Linux. Doesn't matter. You can see it all with a glance. See which employees have used disk encryption, which ones have kept their OS up to date, if they have a password manager installed, it really makes it easy to prove compliance to the auditors, to your customers, to leadership, whoever it be. 
So that's Clyde. User-centered, cross-platform, endpoint security for Teams and Slack. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Visit collide.com slash land to find out. And when you go there, they're going to hook you up with a goodie bag that includes a free t-shirt just for activating a free trial. How great is that? So go to K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash L-A-N. That's collide.com slash land. John Deere has famously been at the center of the right to repair fight for years now, locking their farmers out of their own equipment, forcing the use of company service options. Well, a new jailbreak announced at DEF CON by Sick Codes might just tip the balance of power in favor of the equipment owners. Under pressure from the right to repair movement, John Deere had already announced some plans to open up some of its software to owners of the equipment, but many had emphasized that this was just too little, too late. And now the next shoe has dropped. And surprise, surprise, everyone, John Deere's embedded systems, they're running old versions of Linux and Windows CE. So to develop this jailbreak, Sick Codes got his hands on numerous generations of John Deere tractor control touchscreen consoles. But he ultimately decided to just focus on a few models, and Sick Codes then decided to solder controllers directly onto the circuit boards and eventually was able to bypass system protections, even protections that John Deere had tried to recently update. Once set up, he used an attack on a reboot check to restore the device as if it was being accessed by a certified dealer. He found that when the system was in this mode, it would offer more than 1.5 gigabytes worth of logs. And of course, this log data revealed the path to another potential timing attack that he could use to get even deeper into the system. And boy, did it. Not only did Sick Codes find that all the firmware's code is running as root, because of course it is, but it also turned out that once you were able to get your own software onto the equipment, it would just accept whatever code you put on there and happily execute it. Sick Codes emphasized, saying, the main bug is that nothing's encrypted or checksum properly or anything like that. It's impressive how fragile this empire is. This empire of service repair and locking farmers out wasn't really that well protected once you got physical access to it. Uh, Kyle Wayne's the CEO of iFixit and also a right to repair advocate himself. He attended Sick Code's presentation and he recounted the experience on Twitter saying, Sick Codes has jailbroken a John Deere. And this is just the beginning. Turns out our entire food system is built on outdated, unpatched Linux and Windows CE hardware with LTE modems. Yikes. Also, we should note that there's no patching around this flaw. So we suspect this is really just the beginning for people who want to repair their tractors and other farm equipment themselves. Also, now that we know with certainty that GPL software is used on their equipment, you've got to wonder if John Deere has been in compliance with the terms of that license. I suspect we may find out in time. And uh, yes, dear listener, they've already got Doom running on these devices. You have to wonder what else they're going to get running on these John Deere tractors. What other functionality could they bring to these tractors? Could we one day see an updated Linux distribution for tractors? Who knows? But the possibilities are pretty endless, just like so many other things in the world of Linux and open source. So we'll keep an eye on all of it. Be sure you go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes so you don't miss a thing. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. And be sure to go check out our buddy Alex from Self Hosted on episode 190 of Late Night Linux, recorded during the recent London meetup. As for us, well, we'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs>